I would like to start inviting our uh, next panel, and our next panel is called Not Just for Fanboys, How to Build a Strong Value Proposition for the Wider Investment uh, Community. Uh, so our virtual participant for, for that panel is Eric Staumer. Uh, just a bit of background on Eric. Eric was our chair for the conference last year. Uh, he tried to join us in person uh, again this year. Unfortunately, he couldn't. Um, so I would like to have Eric being introduced first, and then we'll move on to the other panelists. And in the meantime, I would like to invite our chairs and also in-person participants to the panel. The stage is yours. Got uh, our last. So, thank you guys for joining me up here and virtually. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Tarek Waked, I'm founding partner of Type 1 Ventures. We, we invest in anything that progresses humanity towards a Type 1 civilization. Um, we have a heavy space focus. And so I'll pass, pass it off to the rest of the panelists to introduce it themselves, and then we'll go into questions, and we'll leave the end for a Q&A for the audience. So thank you guys for all being here. Great. Thank you, Tarek. Uh, Rob Desborough, I'm one of the managing partners at Seraphim Space Fund. Seraphim Space Fund was the world's <coughs> first fund set up to address the opportunity in new space in 2016. Since 2016, we firmly established a leading position in space investment globally, we invest from seed stage all the way through to pre-IPO transactions. So we're doing half a million dollars all the way through to $35 million tickets, leading $100 million plus rounds. We're UK headquartered, but we invest globally. A third of our portfolio is in California, a third Europe, and a third UK. I'm also CEO of our own space-focused accelerator program, Seraphim Space Camp. Hi, everyone. My name's Nick. I work for Crowdcube. We're an equity crowdfunding platform. I believe I'm the only non-space investment expert on the panel today, but we do more agnostic stuff, so across all types of sectors, uh, B2C, B2B. Um, we've currently raised about 1.2 billion through the platform to date, um, with more and more larger deals coming up, 10 million plus over the past few years. Um, there's new EU regulations that are moving out, so we're moving more into Europe, but historically been more UK focused. Uh, my specific job is to work in the campaigns team, so executing on these particular raises and ensuring that they can raise as much capital as possible. Um, I'm the early stage lead, which means that I'm in charge or responsible for the early stage function of the business as well. Our panelists virtually, if you don't mind introducing yourselves. I'll, I'll go. Um, my name is Eric Stalmer. I'm the Executive Vice President of Voyager Space. Um, Voyager is a vertically integrated company that runs a number of tech subsidiaries in the space supply chain uh, from Earth orbit to the lunar service and beyond. Uh, prior to joining Voyager uh, a year ago, I ran the Commercial Space Flight Federation, which was an organization made up of about 90 different um, commercial space companies and um, and organizations uh, all around the, the world. Uh, and we have um, advocating on policy and regulation uh, and smart growth for the commercial space industry. So I'm happy to, happy to be here uh, virtually. I wish I was there in person with you all, but uh, just couldn't make it happen today. I guess I'll go next, if you go alphabetically. I'm Raphael Rutgen. I'm the uh, managing partner of something called E2MC Ventures. E2MC stands for Optimus capital, which is sort of our mission. We are a purely space-focused venture capital firm starting to invest from the seed stage. We're also global in nature. I'm sitting in Europe. My partners sit in the US. Um, I'm also a co-CEO of a space-focused SPAC in the US. I actually own the investment committee of a space crowdfunding platform, so very happy to see there's uh, crowdfunding people here today. And I teach on space business and finance at a few universities, including the International Space University and the Swiss Institute of Technology. My name is Stefan Recchi. I'm uh, the executive director of GenSpace. GenSpace is a planet of the Gen Global ecosystem. We're in over 170 different countries. 
our charter at Gen Space is to promote space entrepreneurship and connect up all the various disparate ecosystems in space. I'm also on the EBAN Space Executive Committee, and I am the CEO of Angelus Funding, a trust-based global angel investment network. Thank you, guys. Um, so the first question I want to prompt to all the panelists is something that I heard from the last panel about uh, billion, the billionaire space race, and how does that impact your work in early stage investing? Is it beneficial, or is it, uh, a, is, is it make the industry look bad? What are you guys' thoughts? Um, well, I think from our perspective, you know, they've really uh, they've created a fantastic story out there. They've created a lot of news, and that has certainly helped us when it's come to fundraising for our own fund. But I think it has to be tempered in terms of what have these guys actually done. Well, it's not about space tourism. It's not about billionaire joyrides. These guys have, in the main, completely changed the economics of space. And I think that's the message we really need to think about, and we uh, have to help educate the media about as well. Well, for me personally, I think um, it inspires the next generation of people wanting to get involved in the space industry. And somebody's going to have to lead the way. These billionaires, as we can, if we, if we want to take a negative connotation to it, yes, the billionaires are trying to get off the planet. That's not the case because a lot of the technologies that we'll be building from the space industry will help a lot of the problems that we have here on Earth today. And um, so I think, as, uh, as my, my co-panelist has said here, Rob, it does help the space industry for, uh, for the formation of capital, which in turn allows us to invest in early stage companies progressing what we call humanity forward. Um, so that's, those are my two cents, but I'd love to hear if any of the virtual panelists have uh, any thoughts. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a little critical of the, um, the critics that, that uh, are, are all up in arms about, you know, sending people to space uh, and, and the impact that it has. I, I tend to find these people to be the Johnny come lately's and they need a new story to cover and not really seeing all that has been going on in the commercial space industry for like the last 10 years or so and all that space has done for humanity uh, in the areas of, uh, you know, um, communication, broadband, remote sensing, you know, the imagery, you know, the, all the tools that space gives us here on earth uh, yet they want to focus on you know a few people that are uh, they're actually helping expand the you know the the the, the economy deeper into space into the really true low low Earth orbit um, in, in suborbital. So um, I, I kind of uh, I, I'm a little biased against them because I think that you know they're just looking for a news story and and, and a headline to grab. So I think there's a lot more to the space economy than a handful of people going up in space right now. I think, I think there is that. There's the clickbaiting. But I think this is also not new. If you go back to the days of Apollo, there was, for example, a famous article in the US. It was called The Moon and the Ghetto, basically saying, well, we send people to the moon, but effectively, we still have ghettos around. So this kind of criticism is, is not new. And I think I'm sort of with what Rob was implying, that it's up to us as a community to to edu educate a broader public about the benefits of space. And, and I think it's so crucial to really recognize that it wasn't easy. It involved a lot of people, a lot of companies, a lot of pieces, components. And what this is doing is it's just helping promote, first of all, the inspiration in people's hearts to achieve space, but also to do anything that's STEM related. Um, and it's, it's great in terms of um, PR for uh, the traditional investors to start thinking about, well, they can invest in space opportunities. That's been the charter for us at Gen Space is to promote uh, space to the non-tech, uh, non non-space uh, investors. And it's equally a normal pattern that we see in other sectors as well. You know, you look at aviation, you look at even wealth, like wealth management. It used to just be for the very wealthy, and now you have fintech apps that enable anyone to manage their wealth. So it's a natural process in a nascent industry yeah, okay. I agree with you there. I mean, if you look at aviation, the first transatlantic flight in today's dollars was about 125 to 250,000. I don't know the exact figure. And within 10 years, that dropped to affordable prices for everybody around the world. And the same thing will happen with spaceflight as you scale those industries. So on that note, do we believe as investors that this is a bubble? I think that's a 
that's a, a biased question, but where do we see the future of the space industry, at least on the early stage investing side? Um, well, I think from my perspective, we see space investment as ultimately an investment into future digital infrastructure. If you want to solve an earthbound problem, the best way to do that is from space. So I think we're building the future infrastructure of future utilities today, that platform in space, and ultimately as we move forward, that platform will be established and we'll be looking at investing into the apps that sit on that platform. From our perspective, this is a multi-generational uh, opportunity. It's not going to go away. This is a long-term trend as we move um, you know, existing utilities and industries from terrestrial environments into the space, and we look to build the right kind of infrastructure to support things like ubiquitous connectivity, uh, to address climate change and these kind of aspects. So you know, we're not looking at a single industry here. This is a horizontal play. And as a space-focused investment fund, do I think we will exist as a fund in 10 or 20 years' time? Yes. But will we be a space fund? No. We'll just be a fund. You don't get internet-focused funds anymore or software-focused funds. So I think hopefully we'll do a good enough job that we almost don't exist. Anybody else? I mean, I can't speak too much for the space bubble, but there's definitely a private equity bubble at the moment. I think the major difference is because with private equity, there's not much liquidity in the market, it's difficult for that bubble to burst in the, in the same way. Um, but if you just look at the amount of quantitative easing there's been across the world recently, um, and the amount of money that's funneling into the wealthy, typically funds, um, banks, financial institutions, high net worths who invest into startups, into the startup ecosystem. So, I mean, the, the valuation increase and multiples that we've seen over the past few years have been drastic. And I think COVID shows that because in the private equity world, you can just put the brakes on. There's no one selling uh, in real time. So ultimately what happens is people just say, okay, we're not gonna raise right now. We'll do a convertible loan note instead of an equity round. And that way you, you basically defer that to a, to a later stage. So is there a bubble in my opinion? Probably in lots of markets, not just the space market, but will it burst in the near future? I, I don't think so. So where I'm going with that question is, when I look at startups really early on, we're not really optimizing for revenues or optimizing for profit really early on. We're optimizing for potential, the team. We're backing a team, really. And when you look at their LOIs, which is the main driver of, you know, does the market want this product? A lot of those LOIs come from other startups. So if there's a, there could be a ricochet effect in the early stage market that could really impact the industry. And we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to push this industry forward from a commercial perspective. And so that's my personal view. I think we're in a very special moment and we have to avoid, you know, we have to support our startups on the early stage side. And that'll come down to having more funds and more investment firms understand mm -hmm. that there's an investment in space and understand that and, and that's what the billionaires are driving. They're driving that awareness from the public markets, and you're seeing a, a, a hunger for SPACs. So if anybody wants to touch on those points, feel free to be my guest. Mm. Just picking up on your last point there, I think one of the things, and this is perhaps more unique to a UK or European environment, we don't have enough lead investors who can um, support due diligence into a space tech company at Series B and beyond. When that company is looking to raise 20 to 50 million, there is plenty of capital out there, but that capital needs to leverage sophisticated investors coming in who can really lead the charge on a space tech deal. And I think that's potentially where we're going to get a bit of a bottleneck for companies moving forwards. Sorry, Tarek. Johnson. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great. Yeah, I wouldn't, uh, it, uh, just picking up a couple of points, Tarek, which I think you mentioned, which are important. The one is the sort of the LOIs from other space companies. I mean, I'm old enough to have lived through the internet, and that's, of course, exactly what happened in, in 2000, right? Basically, uh, there was this sort of like um, destructive effect of one company going bankrupt and dragging, dragging down the others. You know, I think said that one thing that's important to remember on the financing side or in general in space is that we have this still material and very important presence of the public sector of of governments and that I think will help will continue to help us to to backstop things to some extent. 
Yeah, I guess my one concern is how sustainable are some of these business models and some of these um, these ventures that are going out there. And the, the obvious one I see is this uh, the investment in launch um, and not just, you know, a few launch companies there. There's and, and this number is so fluid, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But I, the last I heard and this was uh, like the last conference I spoke at, there was 170 launch companies in development uh, and and i just see no way of the market being able to sustain even a fraction uh of that number um in the near term and even in the midterm uh and i and i'm cautious of companies that are uh, how do i say uh i want to say selling a bill of goods to investors because investors need to do their homework but i i caution sometimes when they aren't doing their homework and, and believe that there's a market for for a company to launch, you know, hundreds of times a year, and, and that there's really a market for that um, in the near term, and uh, and and I think there's going to be some investors that get burnt, and that's that's a concern of mine that where the capital will dry up for for more legitimate projects that I think could offer a lot more um, to the economy than than the launch, and and I've always been a launch guy, so I'm not. I'm not you know bad mouth in the launch industry. I love it, but I just I, I think there's a there's a finite number there's a limited number that of of launch uh, vehicles worldwide, and and I can tell you that number is not 170. So so the good news here though with with the entrepreneurs pulling together businesses in space is there is a litmus test that you can apply to them. You can see if they are gonna if they're investable in terms of are they going to be sustainable. So. Shame on us if we can't do the diligence on them to see, like Eric saying, you know, how many different launch companies are there if they don't know about that or how they differentiate about mm -hmm. themselves. Um, it, it's an opportunity. It's a great opportunity, and, and I think we're we're really positioned well uh, in terms of at least looking and doing the diligence in these companies mm -hmm. to see if they're investable. Yeah, I agree with you, and it, but I mean, I will disagree with the hundred launches. If it was, if money wasn't an issue, I would personally go up a hundred times a year. I don't know about <laughs> you guys. But, um, but I, do, I do think there's probably room for 20, 25. That's kind of the number that's being thrown around. And there'll probably be a consolidation. What do you think, Eric, of the launch companies? Or do you think you'll see a massive you know, bankruptcy of these launch companies? I think globally, 20 to 25, maybe a little bit more. I look at the, the US market, you know, and, and the... Um, and the U.S. market is global, I guess. But, you know, I look at the amount of uh, payloads that are going to be launched in the next 10 years. And it, on the surface, it looks like a really large number. But when you look at the amount of those launches that are already committed, if you look at the aggregation of launches, that one vehicle can take up 100 satellites, that number gets smaller and smaller. So then, you know, five years out, you're competing for about, I don't know, 2000 and this is a high number about 2000 you know uh, um payloads a year uh and, and again it, for for these smaller launch companies there's a niche to being exactly where you want to be you know in that that directed um orbit but i i think the 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 short term is is the the aggregation and i and i think there's companies out there that are are working very hard to make the aggregation very efficient to uh to eliminate some of these smaller companies um, I, I think it's a big tent. I think there's room for many. There's not room for all. Um, I think from our perspective, it's a question of, is it actually, is launch still a, a venturable opportunity in terms of the kind of venture returns you can make? And I think that's the big question. Uh, we've looked at pretty much all of the launch companies out there, and we've not made an investment into that area. And from our perspective, when we started looking at this, we felt it was becoming increasingly commoditized, and it was potentially going to be, uh, become a race to the bottom. Our view exactly. was that there were going to be launch providers within different geographic territories, and I think that's still very much the case, serving the need of the more localized community. Um, so from our perspective, I think there is money to be made there, but is it going to be a venture return? And that is the big question. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, personal thesis of mine is I'm looking for startups that are taking advantage of increased payload capacities that, say, Starship and other heavy, super heavy launch vehicles will, take, will have. Um, 
what do you see as the impact of, say, Starship coming online to the early stage investing community? And what startups would you be excited to see that are taking advantage of those types of, um, you know, new launch abilities? Yeah, I'm with you there, Tarek. Um, we're also very keen to see more business plans that would actually explicitly bet on Starship. I mean, maybe start with like, you know, Falcon 9 or something, but that, that immediately have the sort of like a built-in capability or plan to scale up to the Starship. And I can, off the top of my head, I mean, we're probably seeing like, you know, hundreds of business plans, as probably many of us per year. I can think maybe of two or three where that's the case. So this is still something that hasn't really um, pervaded potential entrepreneurs' minds sufficiently from what I can see. Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, I think we're going to see a, a shift in Starship. They'll probably attempt to go orbital this year or early next. Um, so we'll see, we'll see where, where, where we go there. What do you all think about SPACs? What's your, what's your take on SPACs? Um, well, we love SPACs. <laughs> As you know, Spire, yes. Uh, we, we've done uh, three SPACs this year as we floated AST on the NASDAQ, uh, Spire on New York Stock Exchange, and Arkit on uh, NASDAQ. Uh, all companies that are less than eight years old and all went for over a billion. And I think, you know, at the time, SPACs played a really vital role in that ability for a company to raise its C round, D round, and E round in one go and hit the market. Um, the time has moved on for various reasons. I think there's far more scrutiny in terms of the underlying fundamentals of the companies than perhaps was the case six months ago. Uh, the pipe market, which really drives the success of a SPAC, isn't where it was as well. Uh, I think the uh, timely or otherwise, the SEC intervention as well slowed things up. Uh, so I think they certainly have a role to play, and they had a, role to, a good role to play with us, and I'm sure we'll see them back again in the future. And I think we do fit the profile of space tech startups, which are increasingly looking uh, to the IPO market as an exit. And another reason why the billionaire space race is important. Awareness drives uh, knowledge, and then that knowledge allows people to then invest in these public companies, which creates a market for these early stage companies for which to liquidate. Once they liquidate, those, those founders become investors themselves, and which is what you saw with Google, which is what you saw with Facebook, and that's what we're starting to see with SpaceX. We're seeing SpaceX and Blue Origin employees starting companies, and um, other, other big space companies will spin out their own, their own little startups. So we're very excited about that personally. Um, any thoughts online? Well, there's actually um, another element of this capital recycling, which you're alluding to, which is very interesting, which is that the companies that went through SPACs and on average, they would have gotten, you know, two, three, four, five hundred million dollars of additional cash, right, between the cash and trust and the pipe. Some of them are now exactly doing what we hypothesized, which is using part of this cash to start making add-on acquisitions, right? The first one that I saw, I think, was Astra buying Apollo Fusion, the electric propulsion company. Recently, Spire bought Exact Earth, right, the um, Canadian publicly listed maritime intelligence company. And then Rocket Lab just bought somebody where the name escapes me, but I think this will, this will continue as well. And sort of leading on to the comments from one of the other panelists, I think SPACs, um, I, I think actually the SEC is doing exactly the right thing. It was overheated, but I do think they have a continued role to play because you can fully fund uh, some of the very capital intensive business plans that you have in space. And frankly, sort of from a cynical point of view, even if the outcome from investors in some cases may not be good in the end, I mean, we don't know, and I don't want to comment on specific situations, there is no doubt that SPACs have generated material additional capital inflow in the space sector, mm. and probably much more accelerated than if we had funded it by the quote-unquote traditional venture way. If you just look at the SPAC since uh, Virgin Galactic, so the more recent ones, which is not, by the way, the first space pack that was Iridium, but just starting from Virgin Galactic, you have something like $6 billion of additional cash that came into the space sector via, via SPAC. Mm. Yeah. I, I think there's... Um... I think there's two schools of thought. I don't think you can lump all the, the space exits that you know went through a SPAC in one kind of umbrella. I, I think there's some very good SPACs out there and companies that were ready um, to be to go public. And then, I, but I also think there's a handful out there that it's the it's the uh, the path, the last resort uh, for funding for some of them. And, and I think the market will shake this out. Um, but but I I will say with a high degree of certitude that the SEC will 
look at this a lot more closely in the near future. I, I think the resources have, hasn't been put in it. For, this is from a federal regulatory perspective. You know, uh, currently the, the administration is, is dealing with a lot of other things on, on budgetary things and, um, and some of the uh, financial uh, challenges looming. But, but I do believe that in, in 2022, the SEC will put a lot more attention on SPAC, SPACs, some SPACs or SPACs in general, and, and have a closer examination of that. I think it's, I think it's, a, it's a good thing, you know, again, uh, to give people hope uh, and the planning for a startup to be super successful. So it's, it's all good. It's, a, it's part of the whole hype. And the, but the but the real meat behind it, not just hype, where there's an opportunity for someone to to create a company based on an idea, put a business together, and have a really successful exit. So it's it's all it's all positive in my mind. I just you know final comments on that. I think it's going to become increasingly competitive next year. We've just seen the London Stock Exchange. Uh, they've done their review of SPACs and how they're going to approach them as well. So I don't think it's just going to be about the U.S. I think also the U.K. could potentially play a role as well. Okay, on, on that note, um, we talked about the exit path for a company. If the exit's there, the early stage capital will be there or should be there, then your, your mid-stage, growth stage capital should be there as well. How do you view UK companies as UK investors um, with the exit potential? Do you want them to IPO in the UK? That has, the FTSC has the market cap of, say, Apple. Or would you push them to go to the U.S.? Or how do you view that long term? Will it be most of these space companies going to the U.S. market, or would they stay local? I think, from our perspective, any company we're looking to back has to be a global company. You know, we're backing the size of the total addressable market, and a lot of that is going to be driven by the U.S. activity. So it makes sense to look to the U.S. market as well. I don't think necessarily we're yet there yet in terms of an informed capital markets condition in the UK around space. Hopefully, with our own IPO, we're changing that. But I think the US is far in advance of where we are today. So uh, we'll be looking at the US. In terms of exits, when we started our journey as a fund, uh, we were looking towards the large aerospace and defense primes as the potential acquirers of the companies we were investing into. And I think that's really what's changed for us, that they can't afford these companies. They can't afford companies that are going from inception and seed rounds and three years later are worth over a billion. Uh, so I think the only people who can potentially acquire those companies are big tech or potentially an IPO. And the IPO offers uh, a great opportunity because often they're pre-revenue at this point. So you could argue the biggest growth is going to be post the IPO itself. Yeah, I think we invested in SpaceForge. Uh, Raphael and I were, were on that deal together. Um, and my firm led the deal. Uh, and we believe that a big risk is if they stay in the UK from a capital perspective, because there isn't the biggest investors are in the U.S. and when they go to, when they go to their Series A and beyond, you're competing with say a company like Varda, who's mm. around before SpaceForge was around. They ended up raising a Series A of 40 million and a seed of nine. So SpaceForge, in our view, was more advanced than they were, but they just didn't have the eyes on them and the capital to flow into them. Mm. So I think over time we should see. Um, a more global market because you'll miss opportunities and the U.S. will eat your lunch because there's more capital out there. Um, that's just my personal view on that. I actually agree, and I think that happens across other markets as well. If you look at traders these days or people buying gold 200 years ago, there was a level of arbitrage with a certain product, and, and you're getting that similar thing from the U.S. to the U.K. now where there's similar levels of talent in these businesses, They've got the, the skill set, but they don't have the capital. And so you're seeing a massive influx from U.S. capital coming into Europe. I mean, look at France this year. It's, it's beaten what it got in the whole of 2017 in one week, which was uh, a few weeks ago. So there's obviously lots of capital coming over from the U.S., and, and that's pushing up valuations across, across the board as well because mm. valuations are essentially a reflection on the ecosystem. So I agree it's become more globalized ac across the board.
Uh, we tend to find that typically companies need twice as much capital in space tech at an earlier investment stage. Interesting. I would, I would add to what a great opportunity potentially, right, for us who really have their ears very close on the ground in Europe, right, because you have some countries like Italy and Spain where there's great engineers, great teams building great stuff and, you know, nothing stops them in this globalized world to, if they really become successful, to have their ultimate exit in the U.S. Space is for everybody in, in short order. Um, and so in terms of the early stage funds, we have our way of working. What are some alternative ways of, of fundraising and what are the benefits and, and maybe crowdfunding, the benefits and disadvantages of that? From your perspective as an investor, do you shy away from companies that, that, that go the crowdfunding route or how do you view that? <laughs> well, you can start, I mean. Well, I mean, clearly we don't shy away from companies <laughs> um, who crowdfund. Um, I think there's lots of alternative ways and routes of, of finance. Um, and ultimately, people, I mean, the primary function of any fundraise is money. But people need to think about those secondary points, right? So with crowdfunding, um, you know, is passive capital important? Is network scaling something that you want to leverage? Um, then, yeah, crowdfunding is a good route. Uh, if it's more about the value add of a specific investor, maybe it's a particular type of person, then, then angels are a good way to go. Even, I mean, you're not likely to, to raise VC very, very early stage, so angels are a better place to go. And then strategically, if you want lots of capital, if you want more connections, then you, you go the VC route. I think with crowdfunding, historically, it's been about community engagement, customer acquisition, and those are kind of the ancillary and auxiliary benefits that you get from it. But we're seeing more and more how B2B businesses can, can leverage those effects. Um, and historically, we haven't had that many space deals. Um, the way it usually works is there's a company that's the first in its sector, and then there's a few more, and then someone gets it right and absolutely smashes it. Because retail investment, crowdfunding, is about how do you sell the investment to people who are more emotively involved. It's not a really about the, the numbers as much. It's more about the mission, the belief. So as soon as someone gets it right, then it starts to boom, and we see, we see increases in campaigns in investment in money by thousands of percent over a very short period of time. So. We haven't seen much of it yet in the UK start, um, crowdfunding ecosystem, but I think it's only a matter of time before someone absolutely smashes it. And then everyone says, hey, I can also sell my you know, very sellable space business. Yeah, we did a, um, a project, like a B2C project, um, with a YouTuber one time, or last year, where we bought space on a lander going to the moon, and we put up a website, say, said, if you want to buy pictures going to the moon, pay, it, pay $10. And we sold over 100,000 slots, so about a million dollars in about three hours. And so, yes, you're going to see a lot of more, because people can't you know, interact with the space industry. So you're going to see a lot more things like LifeShip that's sending DNA to space, and you had uh, NASA send your name to Mars on one of the, the rovers. So, yeah, I think crowdfunding is one way to get to the masses, and you're seeing space ventures as well. Um, but you'll see also these like consumer facing projects, I think, moving forward. I think from our perspective, it's a really interesting one. When we're looking at, in the main, B2B opportunities, it's really all about the quality of capital around the table. Ultimately, these are more capitally intensive businesses. You're going to have to cover, carry them across multiple rounds. So you want to know whoever you're, is in your syndicate, but they've got deep enough pockets to cover multiple rounds. And ultimately, that, uh, you know, having investors who aren't bringing additional capital in the future to the table, and I'm not saying that would happen with crowdfunding, but it does create issues in the future. And it can also create you know, additional dilution issues for the founder as well. And given the amount of capital you now have to raise to get through to an IPO, they're all things that uh, you have to take into account. Yeah, I think from our perspective, we sometimes view it as a negative signal, meaning that if they were fundraising for a while and they had to go the crowdfunding route, it's for a reason, um, but it, there's, there's definitely strategic ways that crowdfunding can be used. Um, 
So before we open it up to the floor, does anybody want to you know, pose a question from the panel to the panel? Anything we missed here? Great, so we'll take questions from the audience. Cheers, thanks very much. Peter Shaw from uh, Kingston University. Um, so funding for universities is, is struggling at this moment in time, um, especially in the domain of P PhD funding. Um, so is there a, a, a mechanism or a way that perhaps investors directly fund uh, PhD and use the leverage, um, the IP generated, uh, in some sort of future funding model with investors? Is that uh, an idea which, which has been uh, thought about? It sounds fantastic, but having engaged with many universities from an investment perspective, I know how difficult it is to get a, an IP deal that's fit for purpose and incentivizes the PhD founder in the long run. So I, I'd have you know, real questions there. And um, I think where it works well for us is where we see you know, post-PhD candidates who are working at the bleeding edge of technology and have the potential to be entrepreneurs and just want to understand, you know, if I build this business, what does it need to look like in two years' time and can I build that today to raise that Series A venture funding? So, you know, potentially there could be a mechanism for supporting PhDs, but not unless there is a clear path through to how that IP can be commercialised um, in a, a relatively short period of time. Yeah, that's, that's actually... I would say the same for us. I mean, we certainly have situations where actually about to invest in one right now where it's sort of the stage where uh, what Rob called the post-PhD stage, the point being that there is some like specific research result already. So, you know, if I had to take it in a, a biotech comparison, you know, you'd have a molecule already, right? It's very difficult if it's just sort of uh, funding fundamental research and there's really no result yet. Like we are absolutely not afraid of science projects like you know if I, again if i go with the biotech comparison like you know somebody finds a good molecule uh, that, that could be worth hundreds of millions of dollars if somebody just buys it and then kind of takes care of the approval the marketing and so forth and so i can see similar things happening for certain pockets of, of space tech um but but again some, there has to be a minimum of a um, you know a product on the horizon i suppose I, I think you know it's always important to know that we don't invest in science we invest into huge market opportunities and the ability of a team to execute. So that's what we're looking for. So if there isn't a well-rounded thought around the actual business itself, then it's very difficult for us and we'll wait until that actually happens. Maybe one day somebody will make the, the Teal Fellowship equivalent of space. We can all come together and do that. <laughs> Hello, Jamie Lesser from New Space Finance. A, a lot of the investment capital obviously goes into software for those scalable opportunities. And yes, we've seen launch get a, a surprising amount of investment too, but there's an argument that hardware is being left behind. Is there a risk that that's going to hold the sector's development up? Are there sufficient pools of capital available for hardware? I, I mean, I think personally we, we invest heavily in hardware and most space-focused funds also do. Um, from my experience, but uh, yeah, I think if, if not enough money goes into hardware, then the software is just, it won't, won't advance thoroughly enough. Um, I, I look at it slightly differently. I think, you know, definitely within the European environment, we need more money going into hardware, into deep tech. But if you look at all of the businesses we've invested into, their data businesses, ultimately they're selling insight to end customers but first and foremost, they've had to put hardware into space. They've had to build the infrastructure to produce this proprietary data, but ultimately they are data businesses. So it's a question of what you consider the money is going into, first and foremost, building it or actually the end product. Uh, uh, just a question, if we take a comparison with, oh, sorry, did you? Yeah, Khaled Abuzar Barbican. Uh, if we take the comparison with the automotive sector, where you have a lot of suppliers, uh, do you see space moving into the same direction? 
and in, if it's so, where within the supply chain you see the most value? What is that, the hardware supply chain or, yeah, I mean, there's various supply chains we can talk about. Yes, absolutely, the hardware supply chain. Well, I mean, the interesting thing is it's, uh, it's probably fair to say it's still very much a cottage industry, right? Because until very recently, uh, and still arguably now, most things on the hardware side in space are produced in very, very small quantity, right? So you have these almost like workshop type setups. If you're talking about like the number of rockets, the number of capsules, the number of, uh, you know, satellite, satellite components, right? It was very, very small quantities. And that's only just changing now. And one of the interesting discussions you have going on is like, well, should companies just vertically integrate, which is what SpaceX is doing, or can you actually start, you know, taking some parts and, and sort of like um, become a supplier of a specific part and make, make that really efficient, which is, for example, uh, startups like Hadrian in the US are doing. Um, but I think that's still very much an ongoing uh, process at an early stage. I have a question from our virtual audience. So we have a question from Laura. She says, Tarek said that the space industry would follow a similar route to the airline industry when flights became affordable 10 years after the first transatlantic flight. How affordable does he predict space flights to become in the next decade and how will this affect the industry? So I think it comes down to, and I, I, I wouldn't venture out to say a timeline, and I was a generalization to say it would follow the same path in the same timeline. But I do think when you have Starship coming online that can carry, you know, 16 to 80 people, depending on where you're going. And you're going to mass produce those at quantities of over 100 a year to send people to Mars. I think that will bring down the cost and the fact that they're reusable. Hard to say how, how, what the cost will be. But there's also a, um, in Robert Zubrin's book, who's, he's, he's going to be speaking in the next couple hours, he mentioned how when settlers from the old world were coming to the new world, they would usually spend about a third of their net worth just for the passage over. And so when people, say, 20, 30, 40 years from now, start wanting to go to Mars, you could probably expect them to spend that same amount of, of their wealth to come to go to Mars or to the moon or what have you. But going there would provide, um, you know, benefits, uh, economic and, and, and other benefits for, for, for them and their families. Um, so I think it, to, to answer her question specifically, I don't know what, what the cost will be. I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball, but I definitely think it'll come down because more production will go into the manufacture of those, sh uh, those vehicles. And the use case for those vehicles will also increase, hopefully by, by our help investing in the early stage startups that use them. We have another question from Krister. Speaking about launchers, at what point in the development cycle milestone will you start to believe in a, in a company's potential to be among the 20 to 25 that might succeed? Fifth launch. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it, it, it's hard to say, but, uh, and I, I'm not one that's investing in them right now, but historically, if you watch a lot of these, these companies, the first, the, you know, first two, three launches tend to not be successful. And I think the make or break point is the fourth or fifth launch where they, you know, they, they find success and then, you know, open up their cadence. So, um, the, the, the challenges, and I think this dates all the way back to SpaceX, where I, I believe, uh, it was up to their fourth launch. If they, if they weren't a success, they, they would have been out of business, you know? So, um, hence, hence the four leaf clover on every one of their, uh, mission patches, um, from that point forward. So I think it's about the fourth or fifth launch. Got a question actually. Um, where is the main importance when it comes to uh, looking and evaluating a 
investment opportunity? Is it the IP or is it the business model? Uh, because the sector is heavily, IP heavy sector, and historically a lot of the investments have gone towards companies that perhaps won't be generating much revenue through its lifespan, but present a good opportunity for exit. I think for us, you know, looking at the kind of basics of assessments, they're probably secondary characteristics we look for. You know, ultimately, is there a billion dollar addressable market? Is there a team that can really execute that have potentially been there and done it before? And then let's look at the product. What is there today? What milestones have they hit in terms of the development? What is the IP position as well? So IP does play an incredibly important role, but it's not, uh, it's not the single fact that's going to get your attention up front. I, we're a little earlier than Seraphim, so we focus mostly on the team. And um, we love first-time founders because historically first-time founders tend to outperform in terms of returns. Um, existing founders because they're not afraid of making mistakes because they don't know the mistakes are there. Um, and with good guidance, I think first-time founders can be great, um, especially young, hungry founders in the space industry. Uh, but there has to be a growing market, right? It can't be, you know, they're selling some widget or that, that's, that's in like a very specific niche. We want a big growing market. So OrbitFab is one of our first deals we did in 2019, and it was just such a big idea. They had, you know, launched their first, uh, you know, Fuel, fueling station to the ISS to refuel the ISS with water, but their whole vision was let's put gas stations all around orbit so that satellites can refuel, and that's an enabling business. So off of Orbit Fab's business, other businesses can be created, and we saw that in 2019, and that's what's happening today. Um, Spaceforge, another business that is like an ecosystem builder, and is creating a lot of value, and, and we, we had the conviction to lead that round, and it ended up being over three times subscribed for what they initially wanted to raise. Um, so we're looking for businesses that have big ideas and great founding teams that understand that the only certainty is that there is uncertainty. Yeah, let me just sort of caveat this a little bit. I mean, th this is a deep tech business, especially if you look on the hardware side. So. Of course, you know, the, the, the comments on team and market are sort of generic for pretty much anything in early stage venture, right? Um, we sometimes compare a space to biotech. It's like, you got to have a little bit of respect. You got to do like the, the hardcore um, tech due diligence as well. I'll go one more question. Um, should venture capital provide further support beyond the money to actually ensure the success of those projects? It should, absolutely. And I think, to be honest, you know, the best deals can go anywhere in the world. So you know, just providing capital isn't enough. It's about what you can provide in addition to that, you know, your uh, expertise and networks to provide follow-on capability, follow-on capital, your networks with the corporates, with the key stakeholders in the ecosystem your understanding of the growth trajectory and fundraising profile of these businesses. So all of these are critically important in terms of winning the best deals. So absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I think when it comes to value add, we like to look at ourselves not as a technical value add. We like to look at ourselves as a marketing and you know, strategic branding and positioning value add. Because a lot of times these teams are comprised of engineers and most engineers don't have the overlap of marketing and sales and even fundraising. So we try to be that support on the early stage side. Um, and we also, the value add is we bring in some of our LPs to their cap tables early on, and those LPs could be their Series A or Series B leads. So you start positioning the company for that trajectory. Um, and I think investors that add that value can, as you said, win the deals. But then it's also the, the this, what's the strategy of the fund? Are you a platform fund or are you just a material investor? A capital investor. So, so I think by, by definition, uh, you know, space is all connected. So it's really important uh, as investors that we stay connected and, and also leverage our connections in addition to the capital. Cool. 
Uh, my name is Sapar. Uh, two days ago, I reviewed the uh, UK space strategy, and the Seraphim Fund was uh, like uh, nominated as a, one of the priority entity who will invest in space startups. So, my question is: uh, Your pipeline is consists of only the UK-based or European-based startup, or you are considering also the startups from other regions? Thank you. Uh, we invest globally third of a portfolio and our first investment was in California. So we've got a third of it there, a third is in mainland Europe and a third is in the UK. So when we first launched the fund in 2016, our largest investor at the time was the UK government, British Business Bank. They're not anymore, but they were at the time. And we argued to them that, you know, to make this a success for the UK to gain market share globally, then we needed to be attracting best of breed companies to set up in the UK as well to support the industry here. So you know, by investing into a, headquarter, a California headquartered company, they can potentially build their R&D base over here. And there's a massive opportunity around arbitrage of talent. Data scientists in the US, are in, well, in California, are really expensive. They're not in the UK in comparison. So I think there's a great opportunity here to build our own capacity, but still invest globally. Um, I have a question. What is your responsibility as investors, if you feel you have one, to make sure the space industry stays sustainable in the long term, while also ensuring a, a return on your investment, especially since the space industry is not heavily regulated yet, so anything goes, so to speak, if you need to, f to make some profit? So I personally think regulation hinders innovation and I think over time market forces really solve for all of that that regulation would try to solve for um, or most things I guess you I would say um, and so we're looking for businesses that you know obviously are doing their part to the environment if we look at Space Forge for example the fact that they're building the materials they are building in orbit they're gonna take out megatons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere so we're looking for things that have a positive benefit on humanity and the planet. Um, and, and I think a profit follows all of that. So I think we have to stick together, as, as, as Stefan was saying, as investors. And we all kind of fact check each other when we're looking at businesses that are either sustainable or not. I think space has a, an incredible role to play in terms of our global sustainability goals. I think where we have to um, you know, think in the future is around really space traffic management. How do we manage that as a domain to make it sustainable commercially for all of us? Well, on a, on a more humorous note, if we were ever getting invaded by aliens, our only defense would be to create the effect of, uh, you know, breaking up all the satellites and covering our, our Earth with, with all the debris. So more satellites will one day maybe save us from the alien invasion. <laughs> so thank you guys all for, for coming. <laughs>